Hello everyone, I'm the Catholic Bible Geek. Welcome back to the channel. We finished up Genesis in our last Bible survey, and we're continuing through, so it's time for Exodus. And uh, just to recap a little bit with the covenants, you know, we've been through the Adamic covenant, the uh, Noahic covenant with the flood, and we've been through the Abrahamic covenant. And we ended in Genesis with the people of Israel, Abraham's uh, son Isaac, Isaac's son Jacob, you know, in the lineage of that, Jacob's name has changed to Israel. Jacob has his 12 sons. Uh, you know, the, the 12 patriarchs of Israel are, are, are brought about here, and they all go to Egypt. And the story of Joseph we covered, it was such a beautiful story last time. This is how the Hebrew people end up in Egypt. So at the start of this, uh, of this book of Exodus, the Hebrew people are in the land of Goshen. This is the, the, the land that the Pharaoh who was over Joseph gave to, uh, to Abraham gave to, this is the land he gave, not to Abraham, gave to, uh, Joseph's family, gave to Jacob and to all of his brothers and so forth. I mean, they were quite a big clan at that point, you know, uh, 12 brothers, their, their wives, their families and so forth. It was quite a big deal. And he gave them to the land, the land of Goshen. And as you can see in the map there, the land of Goshen is at the North of Egypt there. It's right there around the, uh, the Nile, the river Delta there. It's incredibly fertile land because you've got the river there, not only is it incredibly lush and fertile, so it's, it's you know, going to give, give a lot of wealth, it's also interesting because it's a uh, it, it's right there on the way to other kingdoms. You know, you have to cross the Red Sea or you go up there over that little, you know, land peninsula or, or through the you know, more minor parts of water or bodies of water there and come into Egypt. So it's it's a it's on a route commonly taken into Egypt that would be commonly taken by Egypt's enemies, you know, so. This is where they are, and over the years, they grow into a mighty nation. So, so we're, we're years and years later, the people of Israel are a mighty nation. Now, Exodus tells us that a pharaoh came about who did not know Joseph. And what that means is, this has been so many years gone now, there's no, there's no honoring. It wasn't that they don't know, like, you know, the knowledge of Joseph, you know, swept from history. No, people know what happened. But a pharaoh came into power who didn't honor that connection or honor that uh, ally, you know, uh, of the Hebrew people. And there's there's a lot of good studies and a good scholarship that says, you know, looks at the history of it. I won't go into all of it here, but there were other nations that had conquered Egypt, you know, just like any historical country, you know, our country's history. You've got different, you know, exchanges of power. And there was a, a group of people that came in and conquered Egypt. And they were the ones that would have enslaved uh, the Hebrews. But the Pharaoh at the time of, of when we open an exodus, a pharaoh comes about there who says, let us deal shrewdly with the Hebrews. Now, why would he want to deal shrewdly with them? And he, and he even says, lest they, lest they overwhelm us because they're becoming so numerous or lest they go into league with our enemies. So they're becoming very numerous right up there in Goshen. And if any enemies do come in to invade Egypt, they're going to go through Goshen. So if the Hebrews decide to throw in their lot with any invading army, well, that's going to be quite an overwhelming number to add to that army coming into attack Egypt. And and I'm going to kind of I'm not going to read verse by verse. I've got some verses up here that we'll look at, but I want to move through. Pharaoh says to um, to have first of all, he wants all of the male children of the Hebrews killed. He wants these midwives to just kill any male child that's born to a Hebrew woman. They don't, you know, that they, they find a way out of this, you know, because they're you know, that. They're gassed at that very idea, and God rewards them for this. So then uh, the Pharaoh just says, well, I'm just going to go out. And we're we're going to send out my soldiers, and we're going to drown. We're going to throw every firstborn, or not firstborn, we're going to throw every male child uh, under you know certain age or whatever into the Nile. So this is the decree. And why is that every male child? Well, you know, the, the uh, speculation is that if, if all of the males of the next generation are gone in the Hebrews, then who are those Hebrew girls going to marry? And then who's going to then inherit the land of Goshen, the fertile land that's, you know, uh, giving such wealth and, and, uh, and fertility off. So so that's, you know, dealing shrewdly. You know, the Bible is not, not uh, playing around when Pharaoh says, let us deal shrewdly with the Hebrews. And they're enslaved. Now, not enslaved like we might think of, uh, you know, slavery in the early um, United States history or something like that. I mean, they still have some rights to their land and so forth, but they're enslaved nonetheless. So Moses is born into this, and his mother tries to keep him for a while. She doesn't, she's not going to let them, you know, throw him into the Nile. She's trying to hide him, but it gets to the point where she can't hide him anymore. And she does make this little, 
little tiny boat out of reeds and and uh, pitch and all of this stuff and places her infant child Moses into the Nile River. Do you know me? Crocodiles and and the hippopotami who are vicious and in all kinds of dangers to a human being exist in the Nile. And she put her baby in this boat because it was, it was all she could do, right? It was all she could do and floats, floats him down the river, hoping now it's not just blind because we know that Moses sister is following because we do know, if you know the story, if you've hopefully read the, the text that Pharaoh's daughter sees this little boat floating down the river with this infant in it and says, Hey, let me, you know, bring that to me. What is it? So, you get the idea that Moses' mother had to know that, had to know that Pharaoh's daughter had a habit of bathing in the Nile that part of the day because she sent Moses' sister to go chase after the boat. And when uh, Pharaoh's daughter is like, oh, what a what a uh, you know, what a curiosity, this little Hebrew baby here. Uh, maybe I can keep it for my own child. You know, uh, that's when Moses' sister comes up and says, hey, do you want me to go find a Hebrew woman to nurse that baby for you? You know, and, and she says, yes, of course. So Moses' actual birth mother gets to to nurse him and be his nursemaid there. It, it seems a little too, you know, obviously they, they they were plotting a little bit there. But that story of being sent, a baby being put in a boat and being sent out, this baby that is destined to bring salvation to a people, right? Because Moses is going to bring salvation, to, you know, from slavery to the Hebrews. Uh, and, and the word for boat is actually the same Hebrew word for ark. So we've seen the ark of Noah's ark bringing the salvation of humanity's survival, you know, through the flood. We see this ark later on. We'll see the ark of the covenant. As I said, you know, the, um, the scriptural ref picturing of Mary as the new ark. This is a, uh, a seminal symbol in scripture of salvation coming in an ark, uh, God's salvation, whether it's through a human or through God himself or so, so what, um, God's salvation coming to us through an ark. And it's so ingrained in our psyches at this point that, you know, Siegel and Schuster drew on this for Superman, you know, well, it's, it's some of the details are different, obviously, but uh, Superman's parents for his survival, put him into a little ship, a little space arc, if you will, send him out, you know, into the tides of space with a heading towards earth, because they think he can do some good there and he can lead them into a better tomorrow and so forth, you know? So we, we see this story just um, told and retold because it's so, you know, so seminal to us in our, in our experience. So Moses is raised by uh, by Pharaoh's daughter. He's raised, he really is raised as a prince of Egypt. One day he's going out, though, because he knows he's Hebrew. He knows his sister and his brother and so forth. And he's going out to check on his Hebrew brothers, you know, his Hebrew people. And he finds an Egyptian abusing and mistreating a Hebrew. So Moses, in a rage, kills this Egyptian, buries him, kills him. How dare you touch one of my people? Later on, he sees uh, he sees two Hebrews arguing, and and he says, "Oh, brothers, you know, stop this. We're all Hebrews here. You know, don't you want to stop?" And they say, "What are you going to do? You're going to kill us like you did the Egyptian?" And Moses realizes, "Oh, people know." So we see Moses here, who wants to identify with his Hebrew brethren, but he doesn't have their same life experience. Moses is raised as a prince of Egypt in the you know, the, with uh, Pharaoh in the palace and whatnot. Moses isn't raised as a slave. He doesn't have that experience. He's out there wanting to to try to feel some kindred spirit with his fellow uh, Hebrews, but they're not accepting him. Uh, you know, and they, they gets around that he killed this, uh, this Egyptian. So, of course, he's wanted. You know, he has to flee. And he leaves out into the wilderness. And it's interesting that we see Moses' life divided into three sections of 40. He's about 40 years old when he kills the Egyptian and has to flee. He spends about 40 years out in the wilderness. He does marry the, the daughter of this priest out there, meets her at a well. Again, remember I said the significance of wells, meeting your bride at a well. And then we look at Christ meeting the Samaritan woman, uh, you know, and she'll come. She's she's salvation comes to her, right? She enters into the church and, and as such becomes a bride of Christ in that manner. So, um, so we'll talk about that. We'll see that symbolism as we go through. But about 40 years in the wilderness, and then it's about 40 years that Moses spends delivering the people of Israel from Egypt and, and giving them the, the law on Sinai and going through the wilderness and so forth there. So these divisions of 40, these three divisions of 40, what what is it? Uh, what, what's what's significant about that? Well, 40 is the number of purification. It's a number of testing. And we see Moses, this young man who has these anger issues, maybe has a little bit of a sense of entitlement. We don't know at all, but we can see certain things in there. 
for 40 years until until God lets them see these things and let these things happen. Then he's in hiding for 40 years. And then God calls him at the end of these 40 years of him in exile from Egypt. He sees this burning bush. Now, it's not so shocking that there's a bush burning in the hot you know, desert there, but it's not being consumed. That's the thing. And as you get closer, of course, we know the story. God says, the voice of God says, uh, you know, remove your shoes. You're on ha hallowed ground. And God tells him, you know, the voice through this burning bush tells him. Now, why would God, first of all, why would God just appear to him as a burning bush? Well, God's love is like a burning fire. You know, that's the imagery we see in the Bible, the seraphim, you know, the burning ones and so forth. Um, uh, a, a, a purifying fire. You know, we have that that imagery, too, with uh, with what becomes the doctrine of purgatory, you know, from what Paul says in the scripture and whatnot. So not a fire of, of uh, damnation or torture like, you know, Gehenna hell, but a, a fire of purification, of burning love, of just unquenchable love, God's love, basically, and holiness. And he tells Moses that I'm going to send you back to deliver your people. Now, imagine and Moses obviously says, no, I don't want to do that. They, you got the wrong guy. You got the wrong guy. Why would Moses feel he has the wrong guy? Because you're sending me to go deliver them from slavery, but I've never been a slave. They're going to look at me and laugh and say, oh, who are you? You know, Mr. Princely upbringing, you're going to come. And then also he he messed up, he killed somebody. He's he's wanted and all of this. Now God tells him that the Pharaoh who, who was after your life is no longer there. There's another Pharaoh in power. So, uh, so, you know, he's, that's not an issue anymore, but Moses looks at himself at this point is I've already blown this. I've already screwed up. I, I didn't have the right upbringing to, that could, you know, these people could relate to. I messed up whatever little chance I had at being a help to them. And yet God says you and you alone are to come. Moses continues to, you know, not me, not me. I can't speak very well. God says, okay, your, your brother Aaron will come with you and speak for you. But God never says, okay, all right, I'll change my calling for you. No, God's calling for us is irrevocable. If you feel that God's calling you to do something and it's uncomfortable and you don't want to do it, and when you get to the point where you really discern that God's calling you to do it, there's no such thing as continuing to walk with God while refusing to do what he's called you to do. God's not going to change your calling just because you, you really didn't want that one, so he'll pick something else for you to do. Um he might have to recalculate and reroute things for you, but God's calling is irrevocable, you know, on us for, for salvation, obviously, but also for um for a calling in life. And Moses is learning this. Moses eventually says, Who am I to say is 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 sending me there? Because this is a land of polytheism. There are multiple gods. The Hebrews have been living in Egypt for so long that they still they still circumcise, they still worship, you know, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. But they worship the God of Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob just as another God. They've also got Hathor. They've also got Ra. They've also got Apophis and so forth. You know, they've got these Egyptian gods, and uh, and, and their God, their God is just another one of these gods. So Moses is, you know, encountered with a God and says, "Who, who am I say to send you?" And God says, "I am." Tell him, "I am sent you." And the Hebrew word, of course, can mean "I am," "Who I am," "I am that is." And this is interesting. This is a, pa a fascinating answer to the question. God is telling him, I'm not going to give you a name. No, I'm not just another one of these gods like you might think. This isn't my God. This isn't my name. You know, and you can put my name on a list with all the other gods there. No. God says, I am being itself. I am existence. And if you're into philosophy or metaphysics, you know that this is the, this is the first principle. God is being. This is how we know that existence and being is good. God is being itself that which has no beginning, that which all other beings come from. You know, if you if you're created by something, there has to be a first a first principle that that isn't created. Otherwise, the chain just goes back and back and back, and it never stops. So it's a philosophical answer he gives, and yet it's also an answer that is used as a name. We know the name Yahweh, the the. Uh, in the Hebrew, they, they took out the vowels and they just used the consonants. So it kind of comes across as Yahweh there. He says that, yeah, we're, 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 um, my name is I am. So the word, so the name Yahweh becomes there, but it's very interesting because names mean something. Moses names himself means drawn from the water. Okay. He was himself drawn from the water saved, right? But he's also going to go on to draw the people of Israel from the water 
through the Red Sea, right? When the Red Sea parts and he leads them through, he's going to be drawing them from the water as though, and we know that that's an image of baptism, you know? So names mean something, you know, your name and its meaning is going to, to have uh, effects on you. And God's name is God's isn't going to give a name. I'm not the God of the sky or the God of burning bushes. I am being itself. I am the first principle. I am the one and only God. And that's what God is going to be proving and really trying to drive into people's heads throughout the story here as we continue. So let's go ahead and continue. God gives Moses some signs by which he can know that he is uh that God is 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 the God that's going to lead him through this. One of them is his staff turns into a serpent. Uh, Nashash, I might be pronouncing that wrong, is the Hebrew word there for serpent, which does mean basically snake. And uh, Moses reaches down and picks it up and it becomes the, the staff again and whatever. But that's a symbol of God's power over these false gods, God's power over demons, basically. Um, then he tells him to put your hand inside your, your bosom and then bring it out and it'll be leprous. It was, you know, a hand riddled with leprosy and then put it back in and he takes it out and it's suddenly healed. This is symbolizing God's victory over disease in the natural world. And then finally, God tells Moses to take this bucket of water and, uh, and uh, draw it out and pour it on the ground, and it becomes blood. And it's symbolic of God's drawing the people of Israel out of, out of Egypt, out of the Nile, you know, the blood you know, the, of the Hebrew people and so forth. So he gets these signs, and these are going to be, um, or one of them anyway, is going to be reflected in the next one. Moses and Aaron, they go to Pharaoh, and they tell him, God, uh, the God of Israel says that God is my firstborn son. Let my son go that he may serve me. This is in Exodus 4.22. And we find there the original purpose of God's plan here. Israel, we know that from our look at the Abrahamic covenant, that Israel was to be a nation, God's chosen people, through which the entire world would be blessed. It was never about this is my chosen people and these are the only ones I care about and love. You know, you know. No, it was obviously a... a through the whole world should be blessed through them. And you see by Israel, by God calling Israel, the people of Israel, the nation of Israel, his firstborn son among the nations. Well, we know what that means. We've been talking about that in the patriarchal uh, culture. And the firstborn son was the one who becomes the next priest of the family. He's the one who guides the brothers and sisters, becomes the next patriarch of the tribe, you know, and so forth. So the firstborn son is is uh, is crucial there. And that was the plan for Israel to be the ones who would lead the world, you know, into God. And we see this um, plan. We see them mess it up a little bit at Sinai when we'll look at that later next week. But uh, but that's the, the plan here. So Moses and Aaron don't go to Pharaoh and say, let them go, set them free, you know, this and that. No, they say, he says, let us go and worship our God because it's, you know, I guess God said that Israel is my firstborn son. Well, Pharaoh says, I don't know this God. I don't know this God. Pharaoh is thinking of the God of Israel as just another God among the Egyptian gods there. Pharaoh says, I don't know this God. Now they're asking to go and worship. And uh, this is not proper pronunciation, but the word is avodah some variation of it there in the scripture. There's the Hebrew word for worship. And it's the same word that the uh, word for work in Hebrew derives from, because the same word can mean worship, work, service, you know, to a God or whatever. So the people are, uh, Moses and Aaron are asking, let us, let us go and Avodah worship our God. And Pharaoh says, I don't know your God. Tell you what, your people can Avodah more right here. They can work more right here. So it increases their workload. So we see this, this, uh, you know, battle of pride here. Pharaoh's refusing to believe that this God of Moses and, and uh, Israel is any bigger than any of his own gods, if that even exists at all, right, in Pharaoh's mind. So we've got this, this real insult to, uh, to the people there. Now, Moses is also given some signs for Pharaoh. And the sign that he gives, of course, the famous one is Aaron throwing his staff on the ground. It becomes a serpent. And it becomes a, um, a uh, Aaron reaches, or, um, it becomes a serpent. Now then Pharaoh's magicians and people and high priests or whatever turn their staffs into serpents too. And then we know that Aaron is, uh, Aaron's serpent, Aaron's staff become a serpent, eats up their serpents. The word for serpent here is different from the word that it was when the sign of uh, was given to Moses there. This word, I believe it was tannin. I forgot to write it down, but it means, it can mean crocodile. It's a different word. It doesn't necessarily mean snake. It can mean crocodile. And here we have a, a 
an example of God's authority and dominance over the gods, lowercase g, of Egypt, because I think the god's name was Sheket, if I'm pronouncing that right, if I got it quite right, was a crocodile god, you know, from the, of the Nile there. And that's what Aaron's staff turns into. Aaron's staff hits the ground and turns into a crocodile. Well, the fact that the high priest, that Pharaoh's mages and high priests can do the same means that they've been given power by somebody, by this god Sheket, who must be a demonic force. They've been given some power, but then for Aaron's crocodile staff to turn around and eat their crocodiles and then become the staff again, that's that's laying down the law. That's saying no one is more powerful than me. You, you, can't, you can't do the same thing that, that our God can do. So it's, it's, we see this, this work for dominance, and this is the prevailing theme here, proving God's place as not just another God, but the God, existence itself. So we get, obviously, to the plagues. And each of these plagues is a, is a attack on one of Egypt's gods, and so much more. You know, we'll walk through and we'll just develop this as we go through. Uh, the first plague, uh, turning all the water in Egypt into blood, specifically uh, the water from the Nile. The Nile is what just, you know, uh, strengthens and gives life to Egypt. The Nile is the backbone of Egypt, and uh, and it turns to blood. And this is a judgment against the god Hapi. Happy, I think it's Hapi, uh, the god of the Nile. The Nile itself was worshipped as a god, and uh, you know you would see this figure often look like you know water, blue wavy water, uh, god of the Nile, but not of fertility. And that the Nile was a fertile giver of of uh, you know nutrients to the land, so that the land could be fertile and grow crops and whatnot. So uh, a judgment against that. The second plague, a plague of frogs. It's not random. It's not God thinking, uh, frogs are gross. Let's send them a bunch of frogs. No, the Frog plague was a judgment against Hecate, the frog goddess of fertility. It was a goddess who, uh, you know, frogs laid tons of eggs. You know, they're they're uh, thought of as is uh, sacred. And this goddess of fertility, uh, Hecate, is usually pictured as a as a frog, at least a frog head there. So we see a second goddess of fertility, you know, our second deity of fertility, because uh, the the god of the Nile wasn't a goddess, but we see this uh, second deity of fertility. And what is fertility? God told God told Adam and Eve to go be fertile and multiply. And we see that, you know, we saw in Genesis when you had a strain of men go off and wanting to increase their own name. Well, part of that is to have lots of children, have lots of, uh, you know, have your own dominion, build your own tower, build your own great city, you know, your, your project, what you leave behind. And being fertile is part of that. So, so Egypt has these deities of fertility and God attacking specifically, he'll attack some other gods here as well, but they all play into this idea of fertility, specifically attacking the idea of fertility is, is attacking not only these false gods, but also the Egyptians desire for that, that own fertility or power for themselves, right? Making their own name great versus uh, following and making the name of calling on the name of God. The third plague is the plague of gnats and beetles here. Kefir is a scarab-faced god who represents the rising of the sun, which also is associated with new life or creation. Again, fertility, new life, creation. And every time you see him, there's a real actual image of him. There would just be a scarab on his face, you know, in all of the art. The fourth plague, the plague of flies. Shu was the god of the air, the god of preservation. He was the god of, um, of dry air which was a preser preserving factor, you know, the mummification and whatnot, dry air preserved. His sister, Tefnut, was a goddess of humid air, which brought about change, decay, you know, uh, humidity and whatnot. So, but he was the god of dry air, Shu, of preservation. So the plague of flies, and he was often depicted with wings like, you know, fly-like wings or something like that. Um, not necessarily depicted as a fly itself, but that's the uh, that's the the judgment against Shu there. A judgment get this idea of preservation, you know. And think about what the the uh, Egyptian did with with mummification and whatever, trying to preserve what they left behind, uh, building up their own dominion. Right after the the fourth plague, there, Pharaoh says, "You know what? Go, go sacrifice to your god, but do it here. You can't leave. Do it here. Do it here. And eat. just go sacrifice to your god here. Stop these plagues. Just go sacrifice to your god here." But Moses said in Exodus 8, 26 and 27, he says, it would not be right to do so, for we shall sacrifice to the Lord, our God, offerings abominable to the Egyptians. 
If we sacrifice offerings abominable to the Egyptians before their eyes, will they not stone us? What is he talking about here? What what sacrifices would the uh, Hebrews sacrifice that are abominable to the Egyptians? Well, what have we seen the people of God sacrifice throughout the Bible? Goats, calves, you know, blood sacrifices here, uh, rams, you know, and so forth. And Pharaoh says, no, you're not leaving. They're not leaving. And we, this is this is shown forth and proven in the next plague, the fifth plague, in which God just goes straight to it. Then fine, the death of all livestock, because livestock were sacred to the Egyptians. Uh, they often were animals that were associated with deities. So these are just some examples. Apis was the bull god of fertility. Again, fertility, a primordial power. Hathor. Hathor was basically the Egyptian version of Venus, you might think, but she was often associated with calves. Remember that calves. She wasn't necessarily supposed to be a calf herself, but she would also take sometimes she'd take the form of one or she was associated with calves. Uh, then there was uh, Kanum, if I'm saying that right, the god of water, procreation, you know, birth, that kind of thing. Again, fertility uh, depicted. He was always depicted with a ram's head. These are just some examples. So Pharaoh says, just just sacrifice here. Moses says, no, we we you know we get stoned if we sacrifice here because we're sacrificing to animals that would be abominable to the people of Egypt. Egypt to see sacrifice. Well, that takes off Pharaoh more. He's like, well, you're not going. So then God says, well, fine, we'll just kill all of your animals. <laughs> we'll kill all of your livestock that you think are so precious and sacred. Again, all of these plagues, none of them are random. They're, they're targeted against this notion that Egypt has of false gods and the people of uh, of Israel. The Hebrews there in Israel and, and in Egypt are seeing this happen because, remember, they've been worshiping and we'll find out later, they've been worshiping these Egyptian gods alongside the God of Jacob and so forth. So they need to see this, too. The sixth plague, the plague of boils. Well, this is a judgment against uh, Sekhmet, Sekhmet, the god of healing, this lioness um, faced goddess of I think it was goddess of healing. Um, yeah, I think it's a goddess, but healing, uh, relief and whatnot, plague of boils. There's nothing she can do for him. The seventh plague is the plague of thunder and hell the sky raining down torment. And this is a, a judgment against the god Newt, who was the goddess of the sky. And this is her with the blue and the stars over her there. She's often pictured as the literal sky. Uh, she's associated with the sky, stars, the cosmos in general, uh, the giver of good things. And she is uh, powerless to, to stop this attack that they're receiving from the sky at the hands of this god of Israel. The eighth plague, the plague of locusts. There's this god Serapis. Uh, he's an interesting god. He's um. Most of the images we have from him now are a little Greco-Romanized, but um, among other things, he was their protector, protector of things like their flock uh, crops and whatnot against locusts. And this plague of locusts is, is a judgment against him. And then finally, in the ninth plague, and we have 10, but in the ninth plague, the sun is darkened. Well, if you know anything about Egyptian gods, you probably know Ra. You've probably seen that eye of Egypt there. If you guys have seen Stargate, you know these, these characters, Ra, Hathor, and so forth. Um, wonderful wonderful series but uh the sun is darkened so that's a judgment against their primal i mean he's like the god the sun god for egypt he's one of the oldest because the sun if the nile is where we get a lot of fertility and life well the sun clearly you need that as well so it's a judgment against ra but then we have the, the last plague the last plague that finally breaks pharaoh the slaying of the firstborn of egypt and this, on the one hand, is a judgment against Pharaoh because Pharaoh was worshipped as, uh, or Pharaoh, excuse me, uh, was the one who killed the firstborn of Israel. Remember, kill all the male children of Israel. So now God's going to kill the firstborn male children of, of Egypt, you know, return for that. But we have this, uh, Pharaoh was worshipped as a god, kind of like the, the Roman emperor was kind of worshipped as a god. The Pharaoh was also worshipped as a god. Uh, he would be preserved in the in the pyramids or whatever, you know, uh, going to the gods. And if the Pharaoh is a god, then the Pharaoh's firstborn is heir to not only the throne, but heir to godship as well. So it's it's this is final one is going straight to the heart of Pharaoh. This is a judgment against you, Pharaoh. Now, I might go ahead and talk about this. Now, the scripture does use the phrase. You'll see this in there. Then God hardened Pharaoh's heart. This does not mean, and some people agonize over this, and, and I wish that, that uh, more explanations were given in scriptures and translations and whatnot. This does not mean that God took away Pharaoh's free will and hardened his heart. And I've heard, tragically, I've heard people really trying to make sense out of this and trying to say, well, you know, God is God. If, if he, you know, if he, if he gave you a choice and you didn't choose, he can go ahead and just take away your free will. God, no, God does not take away your free will. That's, that's something that, that 
he's given us here on earth. We freely can choose to, to follow him or not. It also, that phrase hardened his heart is also used in the scripture, meaning that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. It's used like, I forget how many times in this passage, but sometimes this, this story, but a lot of times it's Pharaoh hardening his own heart. So what it means is basically kind of a, a weird way of saying it here, like by God hardening Pharaoh's heart, these commands that God is giving, let my people go or let them go worship, uh, let them go worship and slaughter animals that you think are sacred. God knows that these commands themselves are going to harden, Pharaoh is going to harden his heart against them. So by giving the command, the command which makes Pharaoh harden his heart, God has hardened Pharaoh's heart, if that makes sense. It's a weird language thing there, but it does not mean God taking away a free will. God's confirming Pharaoh in his, uh, in his choices that he's made in his hardness of heart. He's giving him these commands, which he knows because of Pharaoh's hard heart will not reach him and will not get through to him. So the the uh, we're going to almost done here, but the slaying of the firstborn brings us to the Passover, and this is something that we could talk a lot about in death, but read, but obviously we're trying to move through here. The Passover, the the people of Israel were given very specific rules. If they didn't want their own firstborns to be slain, either their firstborn of their family, their children, or the firstborn of their flocks, and so forth, if they didn't want their firstborns to be slain, they had to follow this this very specific instructions. They had to take this lamb whose uh, bones had not been broken, you know, this blemish, lamb without spot and blemish and so forth, and it would be their Passover lamb, and it had to be killed. The blood of it had to be, you know, spread over the, the um, lentil there. And they had to eat the flesh of the Passover lamb. This was important. If you just didn't like lamb or you really weren't so much of a meat eater, you couldn't just go get a ready-made wafer and say, well, this is going to represent the Passover lamb for me. No. If you didn't eat the flesh of that lamb, your firstborn died. This is how serious it was. In Exodus 12, 8, they shall eat the flesh that night roasted with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. And it goes on to give more instructions and don't burn any of it. This let or burn what's left. Don't leave any of it or whatever and so forth. Um, they had to eat it. And of course, we know that the Passover and the Passover lamb is a type, is typology of Christ. Christ is the Passover lamb, the final, the one and only Passover lamb, the one that this Passover lamb of the, of the Passover feast was always looking forward to. And we are to eat the flesh of the Passover lamb. Jesus instituted the, the Eucharist. Jesus instituted the Last Supper at the Passover meal. This was the Passover meal they were having there. That's what the Last Supper was. And he says, take, eat, this is my body, this is my blood. Earlier in John 6, he had said, unless you eat the flesh and, and drink the blood, eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. Uh, life as opposed to death, as opposed to the, the angel of death, you know, passing over and so forth. This is, uh, the, why would it suddenly be symbolic when it came to Jesus? It, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Once you really understand the intricacies of how Jesus is the Passover lamb, and, and everybody knows that, you know, or it's, not everybody knows that, but it's a common thing. Protestants, Catholics, everybody, you know, knows that Jesus is the Passover lamb. But you really go into the intricacies of it and how important it was for Israel to eat the flesh of that Passover lamb or they wouldn't have life. They'd get death, you know. Um, this is this is very important, and it's important for us to eat the flesh of our Passover lamb, which is why in Catholic theology we have the Eucharist uh, being transubstantiated into the flesh and blood of Christ, you know, which we partake of. Um, again, as I said at the beginning, when I was talking about that other topic, you know, God, as we believe, is bound salvation to these sacraments. It doesn't mean God Himself is bound to them. It doesn't mean that uh, people in my family who uh, are Christians, you know, my, my people, you know, that I'm related to or whatever, who are are Christians and, and dearly love God, but just don't believe in Catholicism. So don't partake of the Catholic Eucharist. That doesn't mean that they're, they're not saved. They're, there's no life in them. God himself is not bound by sacraments, but this is what he instituted. And this is what the church, and this is the, the doctrines, the traditions that they handed down both written and by word. So we, it's important to talk about the Passover lamb, at least as much as that, but then also about the typology of it, which looks toward Jesus. <sighs> So this does this does do it right. This 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 plague, uh, the Passover, the slaying of the firstborn, that does finally get Pharaoh say go go go, and uh, the people of, of Israel they they uh, they receive gold and all these you know treasures from their their oppressors the Egyptians just to get them out of there go, and we'll pick up on that next week and we'll actually start with the crossing of the Red Sea, 
maybe we'll get all the way to Sinai and the Ten Commandments, although that really should have its own, um, you know, its own night, I believe. But uh, 